This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Welcome to Five Questions, Dan. Thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. Did your mother call you Daniel? Yes, she does. Yeah, okay. it's my birthday. That's my name. first question to you. Good, good <laughs> to be here. She she calls it to me when she's mad at me as well. So uh, well, uh, yeah, God that, rest that, her. that's I a mean, trigger. God bless for me. her. God bless her. God rest mine and God bless yours. Speaking speaking of uh, parents, what did your parents see in you as a child that made them encourage you to be an actor, and how did they support you as your career progressed? They uh, heard me imitating the announcers on television in old fifties television, uh, the Ed Sullivan Show and the Phil Silver Show and the Texaco Star Theater. I would stand in front of the television and and imitate the announcers and uh, the hosts. And my dad, when I was very young, I was about five or six years old, he cut off the top of a hockey stick and he taped some tape around it and put a cord on it and handed it to me and said, here's your microphone. And from then they encouraged me to take theater classes at Ottawa Little Theater in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. When I was 12 and 11, 11, 12 and 13, I was taking uh, improv classes and much later went on to do uh, improv at Second City, which is the school of uh, of improv uh, that, that people know, but uh, they started me off very young, recognized there that I had a, a kind of a gift for mimicry and encouraged me to do it and came to every play that I did in high school and in college and uh, were, were, were on my side all the way through. My mother would have wanted me to stay in school a little longer, but you know, I, I started uh, working professionally at, in 1969 and had to leave uh, university early to get going. I love that. And I do hear from a lot of people that they get pushed to be a lawyer or to be a banker because of the money and because or because the parents were bankers and lawyers. And so it's it's pretty cool to see, you know, a set of parents that really saw something early and were able to, you know, champion you and direct you in the right path. So I, I think that's just awesome. And um, talking about, uh, you know, your days as a you know comedian growing up. Uh, you were all, you broke in when you were at the All Star cast at uh, Saturday Night Live, and uh, back in those those days, you were the youngest cast member. How did being the youngest youngest cast member show up as an opportunity for you to stand out and shine? Um, well, I would say that uh, with my youth came inexperience, uh, certainly in the television, the live television arena. So by being young and inexperienced, uh, I opened up to learning a lot. And from people who were who had done it before, uh, people had more experience in the various art, arts and techni technical uh, disciplines of live television. So I learned from everybody, the sound men, the cameramen, the guys that did the cue cards, the uh, the uh, the graphics arts people, uh, the uh, announcers, uh, uh, the switchers, the uh, just Lauren, certainly, and all of my artistic collaborators. So I, I think that the answer to that question is I was young and inexperienced, and it, it, it enabled me to open up and, uh, and learn a lot from people who, uh, who um, could teach me. Yeah, I think that's important. I believe in the value of lifelong learning and in a sense, Saturday Night Live and uh, your time at Second City was a training ground for you. Not only were, were you performing, but you were kind of seeing other performers and building those relationships that played a pivotal role in your long-term career. And speaking of Second City, City, what did you learn about the entertainment business during your time there that helped you with your future endeavors? That it is a, well, it, it is a business. Uh, it's it exactly that it's a, sh that, that show is a business. I learned that our art, art and commerce can be married uh, profitably. Uh, and uh, that uh, sometimes uh, art must serve commerce and sometimes commerce must serve the art, but you have to have both hand in hand. So what I learned about was marketing, uh, selling the shows, getting the word out on the Second City live shows we were doing, getting the word out on the improvs, uh, selling drinks and food, uh, and good tipping for our waiters and waitresses, um, advertising, uh, execution of a concept uh, from which you start out with nothing and then end up with a, a, fi a finished show, um, and um, 
and also, of course, collaboration, which which I've had all the way through um, the multi careers that I've been, and, and, you know, been fortunate enough fortunate enough to have enjoyed. So, um, yeah, I, I learned about um, running a show and being in a circus, basically, and it is a business. Yeah. No, I think it's important, especially because I, I know so many comedians and actors and people want to get into entertainment, but they don't have the business background and they don't like take business oriented courses yet. You know, art, ne- art and business need to be better friends because, you know, it is the entertainment business, as you were saying, you know, not just entertainment, it's entertainment business. And so just ha- having that acumen of, of understanding how the business operates really, really has helped you into what you're focused on today, which I really want to get into. I was at the premiere of, uh, in New York city for the Patreon. Uh, hold on. I was at the premiere in New York city for Patron founder and billionaire, John Paul DeGioia's documentary, good fortune that you attended as the narrator of the film and his former business partner. Can you talk about the business and life life lessons you've learned from his, him as you launch crystal head vodka? Thank you. Uh, I learned uh, from JP uh, that uh, you must start out with uh, with, a, with a quality story that must never be let up on. If you're going to go to, to the consumer with any kind of a product, it has to be uh, of, uh, of an impeccable quality and superior to what's out there in the marketplace. And that all the way through uh, the uh, the progress of uh, that product's life, uh, however long it may be, you can never let up on the quality issue. Uh, and so starting from there, JP was able to grill, build a great success and become one of the greatest philanthropists uh, we have on the, the planet today, environmentally and uh, with charities all over, uh, all over the world. So he built his businesses on just that old fashioned cue. You gotta start with quality, stay with it and execute soundly all the way through or your consumer will abandon you. And his consumers have stayed with him right through uh, anything that he's ever touched um, because uh, he operates uh, from that tenant. And then along with that is uh, ethical and empathic operation. you know, you can have a strong, profitable corporation, um, but uh, if you don't pe- treat people right, if there's a toxic environment, uh, then uh, it, it will be detrimental to, to what you're doing. We've seen so many brands fall because of toxic uh, environments. So JP operated always from an empathic uh, point, of, uh, point of view. And uh, so quality, empathy when you're operating your business and um, sharing and having fun if what's the point of doing it if you can't have fun and and spread around your good fortune and uh and let others uh, come to success as he did when we brought patron to canada together he generously gave me the importation rights as an agent to bring patron tequila to canada we didn't have it up here and so now canadians can enjoy what americans have for years a quality tequila that they they couldn't before and so I'm just one example of where JP has seeded entrepreneurs and visionaries and said, Hey, get started. I'll help you. And, and we'll build it together. And we built Patron together into the, uh, the, the largest luxury share of tequila in, in Canada, luxury sharing brand. So uh, we have a, a, a lot of percentage of luxury sales in Canada due to, uh, to the work we did now, Bacardi owns it. So uh, I no longer have a formal uh, business arrangement with JP, but I'd love to start, anything again with him any any time yeah once you find these people in your life that uphold your values and and support you you want to keep them close and i think that you know everything you mentioned around empathy is super important it's the empathy you have with the people you work with business partners the customer and then holding everything to a high standard especially in the spirits industry where it's super competitive it seems like every celebrity now has their own spirit and so you know you're able to stand out because of those, those core tenants that uh, he instilled in you. And I think that's powerful. And yep. what's your, and what's your best piece of career advice? Well, I just, uh, okay. That's uh, that question. Number five. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I would say um, that uh, it is to collaborate with 
in anything you're doing, collaborate with experts, people who are smarter than you in the disciplines that they govern, and listen to what they have to say and take their advice. And uh, in building that team of experts or collaborators, make sure that there's harmony right off the top. If you catch any kind of a whiff of disharmony or maltreatment or abusive uh, behavior, that individual uh, must be cut immediately. You got to get rid of that person right away. You cannot have disharmony in a collaborative venture. Um, and I, I've learned this in everything that I've done. And uh, now today, uh, I, as I've shifted from films and uh, into the beverage alcohol business, I went to the best collaborator on the planet that could give me the best water. And that was the uh, province of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Distillery Corporation. Uh, I knew that they were experts in distillation and I knew that they had the best water on the planet. So I went to the best and I listened to them and they built me an award-winning vodka, Crystal Head, as you spoke of. We have uh, our corn vodka, we have our wheat vodka, we have our uh, Onyx uh, bottle now which is a blue uh, Weber agave based vodka, never done in the industry before. And so I went to the experts in distillation, the experts in filtration, the experts in uh, glass making for our beautiful package, the skull, and uh, listened to what they had to say, took their advice. And by that, instead of disputing them and trying to cut corners uh, and, and actually going to the lengths that we had to, to and the expenses we had to to build the product, we now have a sustaining um, uh, business, which is in you know seventy countries, and and with uh, with our line extension, the Onyx now a great a great success. Um, so it's it's collaborating with the best and listening to what they have to say, and and not trying to do shortcuts. If they advise you, you got to spend a little more, do a little more to make it great, then take their advice and and do it. And in the end, that's what success is built on. You'll have a durable. Um, a durable brand story. You're smart. No, I love everything you just said. It's you're, you've always been a student, whether it's second city, Saturday night live, you know, probably if, even in your movies now with learning the spirits business. And then it's also about relationships and, and trust is the currency and the cornerstone of those relationships. So you're going to people or building trusting relationships that are leading to long-term brand building and, and success. So I think that's, that's an amazing thing, Dan. And, and uh, you know, I totally respect that. And I appreciate this conversation and thank you so much for being on the show. I love learning from people out there in the market, from whoever stocking the shelves or the, at the forklifts in the warehouses or, you know, or, or at the retail level or at the manufacturing level, the people, the consumer. I, 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 I'm always learning. I'm on, I am the eternal researcher and being in the, in the vodka business and touching uh, so many uh, with, with something that I believe in is, is not only fun, but it, it's, it's, it's a continuing education is what the, what the consumer wants next and what they're going to continue to drink. You know, we're, a, we're, not a, uh, we're not a fad brand. As I say, we're in 70 countries. We're 12 years old now. And, and uh, people are coming back and drinking us again and again because of our story. Like I said, just staying with the quality. And, and I think a little empathy goes into our bottle, too. It's bottled in Newfoundland, Canada. The people there are loving. They speak with a little West Irish lilt. And they walk down the street holding hands and not looking at their iPhones all the time. And I think a little of the love of the people of Newfoundland go into, go into, goes into our bottle. So, uh, you know, we're carrying empathy to the furthest, the, the furthest measure with our product, I believe. Empathy, yeah, sympathy, yeah. and love. It's about love. And the world needs more of all of this. So oh, you're, yes. you're definitely uh, a champion of, of uh, human beings and, and uh, you know, doing the right thing. So I appreciate that. And, and I also think that the through line in your career is for sure, you, you have a lot of humility. You're willing to sit back, listen, and learn from everyone. And that's a testament to, you know, I, I, I assume your parents who we talked about earlier on. And I think that's extremely valuable if you want to build something that has longevity. 